Back in the 60s, the Leafs were a bona fide dynasty, as they would win three straight Stanley Cups. You know what's that? A cup in 67. That's what that is. However, 1967 was the last time the Leafs made the Cup Finals. There was many valiant attempts. The Sittler Saga, the Dougie Gilmore Chronicles. In the late 90s heading into the 2000s, we would see some great teams led by Matt Sundin. But it was to no avail. And in the late 2000s, we would see the notorious acquisition of Phil the Thrill Kessel. And my god, was that a spectacle. We better get him, you better get you on the bike there, buddy, if you're gonna keep eating these cookies. That's your fourth one today. Honestly, at this point, Phil Kessel in Toronto was a fever dream. And all these trades, signings, failed playoff runs would all culminate to the 2016 NHL draft. Toronto proud to announce from Zurich, Men's League Switzerland, from US program. Austin Matthews. On this graphic, we have all the Leafs picks from 2012 until 2018. And to be brutally honest, actually, not bad at all. In fact, pretty great. Of the 50 drafted players, 17 or 34% of them have had significant roles in the NHL. If one in three players end up being serviceable roster players, that is an amazing track record. With their high-end draft picks from 2012 until 2016, they would not miss. Their drafting record has been great, and I would give them a solid 8.5. When it comes to team structure, we can separate teams into two groups. High-flying offense, where games are constantly in the state of high events. Watch basically any Canucks game from last season and you'll know what I mean. And on the other side, we have low event structured hockey. The New York Islanders are a prime example. They will not wow you on every shift, but the player's commitment to systems leads to reliable results. And when a team is rebuilding, that is when you expect to see high event inconsistent hockey, as these teams have a higher proportion of young players who are prone to making more mistakes. And on this graph, we have the Leafs goals for average, and goals against average from 2017 until today. In Matthews' first season, they would barely outscore the opposition. In 2020, they would score a respectable 277 goals, but they would also see a large spike in goals against. Therefore, they were playing high event hockey. Yes, they're scoring a lot, but they're also allowing a lot of goals. In this past season, the Leafs would see a massive breakthrough. Yes, their goals dropped off, but their goals against dropped even more. Meaning, the team has done a much better job adapting to systems. As a result, a player like Austin Matthews would see his production drop off. Now, this also had to do with lingering injuries, but in the same breath, Matthews was also placed in a shutdown role. Instead of being strategically placed against weaker lines, he was seeing far more reps against the other team's top lines. This is a great sign. Matthews in 2022 had his fun. He had his 60 goal season, but considering the upside of his defensive game, the least putting him in a shutdown role allows him to focus on keeping the puck out of the net. Therefore, it allows him to grow his shutdown ability. This commitment is a good sign, as it highlights that the Leafs are committed to playing a lower event structured game. The same thing can be said about Mitch Marner, as he would see a career high in penalty kill minutes, and his progression on the PK, combined with harder 5 on 5 matchups, would even lead to Marner finishing 3rd in Selkie voting. But okay, their defensive structure and commitment is getting better, but what about Grit. This past season, the Leafs would make several trade deadline acquisitions with one goal in mind. Increased grit. They would do that. In fact, they would lead the playoffs with 51 hits per game. And for some perspective, the Panthers had 44 hits per game, Colorado had 38 hits per game in their cup run, Tampa had 42 in their cup run, and Vegas had 38. The Leafs wanted grit, and they got it. With that being said, the Leafs would acquire bottom six grit. Which is a good thing, don't get me wrong, but if we take a look at what Florida did last season, it paints a better picture, as they would average 17 hits per game from their top six. Not only could they score, but they were bullies, whereas Toronto would average 11. And during this offseason, the direction was clear, as they would want grit up and down the lineup. 
As they would sign Tyler Bertuzzi to a one-year, $5.5 million deal, a great low-risk signing. For a guy who can play a physical skill game, I would say kind of like a, like a Walmart, <laughs> Matthew Kachuk. And they would also ink Max Domi to a one-year, $3 million deal, who, like Bertuzzi, has great skill with the gritty game. Not to mention, they would add Ryan Reeves, the scariest man in the league, as these signings were slam dunks. Now factor in Sam Lafferty, who can throw some mean hits, Jake McCabe, on top of signing a mutant in Ben Wah, as the Leafs went from being quote-unquote soft to being a gritty team on all fronts. In every playoff run, NHL teams learn a lesson from the champion. Last season, the NHL would take note on how Vegas dominated due to their center depth. If every single line can match up against any line of the opposition, this is a recipe for dominance. And this is the potential of Toronto this season. As this preseason, we have once again seen Nylander make an attempt to transition to full-time center. And if this works, this is great news. If their center depth is Matthews, Tavares, Nylander, and Kampf, they are right up there with the best center depth in the league. And I'm not sure if this is actually an indicator, but to me at least, it's hard to imagine the Leafs keeping Nylander if he doesn't work out on center. Not that Nylander isn't a great fit, he is, but if he does go back to the wing, it creates a gaping hole on that third line center spot. In the context of having to match up with a team like Vegas or the Avs, Matthew Nyes has huge potential to fill in Button's role, but do it better considering his size and upside. I've also been a huge fan of Yarncroak. The man's a little spark plug who can provide that crucial depth scoring. Bertuzzi and Domi bolsters their winger depth tenfold. Factor in a guy like Pontus Holmberg, who was a stunt in the SHL and will be battling for a full-time spot. I am thoroughly impressed with their forward core. So I'm gonna give Toronto's forward core a 9.75 out of 10. The Leafs defense going into this season is interesting. This last season, they would acquire Jake McCabe, a hard-hitting two-way defenseman with a nice little cap of two million. They would also acquire Connor Timmins, who this preseason is looking like Kill McCarr, what? And they would also sign John Klingberg. And this one is fascinating to me. Klingberg is a great puck-moving defenseman, but he has proved to be meh, you know, unreliably defensively. With that being said, to get the most out of Klingberg, I would have to assume, I mean, let me know what you think, that he would take Riley's number one power play spot. So does Morgan Riley get shifted into more so of a shutdown role? Perhaps, we will see. So for this blue line to be successful, Liljegren needs to take a step. Riley needs to see better defensive numbers. Not saying he's a pylon out there by any means, but now that he's getting a bit older, him taking that role can turn him into a true number one defenseman. Having a guy like Giordano as a mentor surely helps his transition. But overall, their blue line is an interesting mix of grit and puck moving, and I would give them a seven. draft Joseph Wool in the third round back in 2016 and the man has been a monster as Wool would have a ludicrous season in the minors and was a stud during his call up and heading into the playoffs. He has the size and athleticism to be a legit number one. I'm a fan of Ilya Samsonov but his injury history is a little worrisome. So overall I'm gonna give goaltending a 6.75 and this number has the potential to be much higher if Joseph Wool can perform. As it stands right now, Toronto is an offense-heavy team. Their defense does not match up against other top-tier teams such as Colorado and Vegas, but I do believe their offense can compensate. Their cap situation is looking a little rough, but with the rising cap and expiration of John Tavares' contract in 2025, it is manageable. With that, I would love to see Tavares re-sign at a bargain, but one thing needs to be emphasized. Experience. Playoff hockey is far more calculated than the regular season. The regular season is checkers. Playoff hockey is chess. And every time you make it to the dance, you learn something. I love the defensive growth we have seen from Matthews and Marner. Their off-season moves were fantastic. I started to become a Leafs believer last season. And I think they are ready to take that next step. Last year, they would make it past the hump. And this year, I expect much more. But what do you guys think? 
Do you believe the Leafs are serious cup contenders heading into next season? Comment down below. The Connor McDavid pack is still in stock, and I do believe that Otto has still not been pulled. Don't quote me on this, I don't know for sure, but I usually get a message when the main chase card is pulled. So if you like hockey cards, make sure to check it out before it goes out of stock. And as always, thanks for watching.